Welcome back to Coding Shorts. I'm Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to talk about C sharp and pattern matching. I feel like we're in the second renaissance of C sharp. C sharp has been adding a number of features going back to version 7 and version 8 that I know I've neglected looking at really deeply, and pattern matching is one of those. So I wanted to make sure that you weren't afraid to use pattern matching to show you really the use cases where pattern matching is just often the right thing to do. Let's get started. We're going to start here in Visual Studio Code. And I've just got a plain old console app. And I've got a couple of types that we'll need later. But you can ignore those for the second. And I want to start to make you think about pattern matching in some of its simplest ways. So let's create a function here. And I'll just call it show me. And I'm going to accept a string called message. And then I'm just going to right line the message, right? Really pretty simple. Let's say call show me hello world, right? Nice and simple. If we were to run this, we can see our hello world shows up there. Not using any pattern matching so far, we're really doing the simplest thing. But what if we want to know whether this is valid or not? We could say if message is string. So checking based on type, let's go ahead and give it a quick else for right line, no message, right? Let's go ahead and run it again. Still says whole world because what we're passing in is clearly a string. And notice that it doesn't matter that message is actually a nullable string. We're telling it that we want to make sure that this is an instance of string, which is ignoring the fact that it may be null. So we can even make this a little simpler and say is not null. This is probably the pattern matching that I've used the most. And basically saying is message valid? then we can go ahead and use it. And of course, if we run, you'll be happy that it does work. But what if we were to pass in a null here, right? Then we should get no message. Because here it's saying, if it is null, go ahead and move it down here. And so for sim simple so for simple tests for nullability or type, this can be really useful. So let's expand on this a little. Let's go ahead and create an object. I'll call this M and just say, hello world here, right? That's perfectly valid because the object can hold an instance of a string. It can, anything that's a ref type, it can work. And I go, uh, go ahead and call M here. Now, of course, it's complaining because it can't automatically convert an object to a string. So what do we do? We come over here and say, you know what? I'm going to accept an object. And we'll have the same support here. If it is not null, it'll continue to work. But let's change this, because what I really want to say is, if message is string, we want to use it. But this message continues to be an object. So instead of that, what we're going to say is, if message is string, then store it in a new variable, in this case called isMessage. And what you'll see is here that this is a string, because we've con We've confirmed that this pattern is true. And to extend it, we're saying take this and make it that message object. And then when we're actually writing this out, we're using an actual type that we're used to. And so this is one of the concepts you want to think about. And that is that a lot of these pattern matching are about assigning or creating a variable that you're going to be able to use in subsequent code. But let's change this once more to use something like a pattern matching for a switch statement. Ordinarily, you would do something like switch message case null, put in our break there and, and say right line, right? And this assumes that we can take this message and we can test the values. But this switch statement is a bit more laborious for a lot of what we want to do. What we'd really like to do is create a string called the message. And we're going to assign it by taking our message and producing a switch statement. So the idea here is that I'm going to say null, no message. And I'm going to give it a couple of different switches here. Now I'm going to say null, no message. 
And for the second, I want to see if it's a string. And so one of the ideas here is I might be able to create a new temp object. And I'll just call it S when something is true. And what am I going to say is true? I'm going to say message is string. So I can actually return this value. We're using this pattern matching syntax to say, oh, the message is a string, therefore I want to just store it temporarily in a variable and I'm going to return the value of that variable to message. And then for everything else, I'm just going to return unexpected. I can even throw an exception at that point, but I'm just going to say unexpected. And so the idea here is unlike having a switch statement that executes X number of code, this is a pattern matching switch statement that says, you know what, whatever is resolved here is going to be stored in this, the message. That way we know that at the end of the day, we're going to have a string in one of these three cases. Now let's talk about this magic underscore. This is actually called the discard pattern. In this case, we're telling it what we need to do, but this is going to be ignored. This is not going to be a valid. So you can think about this underscore as being the otherwise or default behavior of these switches. This is when none of the rest of them get called. This pattern needs to resolve to a string in one way or another. And if it doesn't resolve to a string, then we would need to do something like throw an exception to cause it to fail out. So if we save this and we do the same thing, we're seeing hello world, but if we actually put a null in there, what's going to happen? It's going to say no message, right? Because we're constructing this message from this switch statement that can return a value. So the switch is on the message, and the result of the switch is being stored over here. And if we change this, let's refactor it again for another case of using the switch, as I'm going to use a status enum that I have. And in this case, I want the switch to be on the status. And so instead of these values here, what am I going to have? I'm going to have status.complete. And then I'll let me copy that for a couple of these. Testing and let's say planning. And here we have the same behavior. Don't worry about the spelling uh, check right there. Of course, it's going to fail. And so this can't be a null anymore. We're going to go ahead and say status equals status dot let's say testing, and just pass that in, right? And so this is gonna work in the identical way. This is a way that we can take a status and map it to one of different enum types. And when we run it, we can see that we're in testing right now, right? Now, this idea of tests in the switch is actually more powerful than it seems on the surface. You know, these, we could have done a lot of what we were seeing accomplished inside of a typical switch statement and just setting some variable based on any one of these. Sure, this is a more concise syntax. Notice that there are no label for, for the different cases. Notice that instead, this is essentially a lambda where we're specifying this is what it needs to be in order to call this code or return this code more importantly. Let's do the same thing for numbers, right? I'm gonna say int. I'll call this value, and then I'm going to say value here. And you'll notice it immediately complains that it can't convert the status to an integer, right? So we could unsurprisingly say one, two, three, right? So I'll change this to, let's say, uh, one. And this should be no different from what you expect, right? We're just doing the cases for a different type. But the real power here, the real unexpectedness here is that we don't have to just say one, two, or three. We could say less than 32, greater or equal to 32, and less than 20, 255, and then we'll just say greater than 255. I always get that wrong, and. We're gonna say greater or equal to 32 and less than 255. And then down here, we'll just of course, say greater or equal to 255. And let's change these values to say small, medium, and large. And the power here really is that we're able to do these range tests, right? Instead of having a bunch of nested if statements, this can really do the sorts of work that we might want it to do. And you'll notice it's complaining about this one being unreachable because of course, this last one is saying if greater than 50, 255. So 
there's not there's never going to be anything that doesn't match this last one. In fact, I could just as happily put an underscore there and it would do the right thing in either case. So let's come up here and let's say 1009 for unknown reasons. We can see that we have large now, right? And if we change this to 109 medium, right? So we're able to do these more interesting tests for the values because these end up being pattern matching expressions, right? We're saying we're going to run these tests against the value that's being passed into the switch. And we're going to return something that we can know what to do about. And you can actually do this for multi-valued objects. Let's put our status back in here. And then we could pass in a tuple, right? An anonymous tuple here. And what will it expect is matching tuples. So let's say that is planning and less than 32, small in planning, right? Now, because we're passing in a tuple, it expects a tuple here as well. So let's say planning greater or equal to 32. So we're doing essentially the same thing, but we're comparing these, or we're comparing whether the status of this object is valid in these different cases, right? And let's change this to pass in both pieces here, right? Medium is still planning because we're sending in that smaller number and planning. We change this to testing, then obviously we would just get not planning, right? And so I'm hoping you see some of this value. Now we're using a tuple here, but what if we wanted to use something like this project, project status? Same idea. And so here I'll say new project status and it's a record so it actually takes status and days behind in here and we'll change this to project status proj status for lack of a better word and then we could switch on the entire object and this continues to work because it knows it has two pieces here right that we're testing the project status based on the order of the items in the type. Now this could be a class, this could be a struct. It doesn't really matter, but this we're still in not planning and let's make sure that it with planning will still work. Yeah, medium still planning, right? And if you're unsure what this is actually doing, we could change this tuple that we're still using for the test to be named. Now it may be confusing what order these are in. And with a record, it's pretty simple, right? It's gonna be the constructor syntax of the record, but for classes, it may be more confused. We can actually change these to be named lambdas, right? Curly braces instead of parentheses, and I'm just going to say status colon that it's planning and days behind, and that's going to work as well. And so this way you can define which of those properties you want to actually match here. You may have a much larger object, and by using named tuples here, you can really specify what you're actually looking at. And I'll just complete the idea by doing that. Let's get rid of that errant comma. Let's go ahead and run it. And we're still getting that same behavior. You can really see here the depth of what we're actually talking about, this way of defining patterns to do pattern matching with things like switch or an if statements and those sorts of things. And we'll make one more change here, which instead of project status, let's change this to bring in a status array. Let's call this statuses. We'll see if that's actually right. And I wanna switch on these statuses, right? And so let's go ahead and status.planning, comma, status.testing, right? And so instead of having the tuples here, we're actually gonna put in a little array. So what we want to say is that the status dot planning and the status dot testing are the two we're going to be testing on, right? We could make a number of these to match what you're passing in as an array or an enumerable. In this case, we're going to say testing and planning and working but complete, right? And I'll just say not valid in this case. So when we pass in these, it's gonna match the array structure as well. And so if we look down here, we'll see we're still in testing and planning. And what's important here is that this patterning will work as long as the structure of the array is something that's fairly well known. 
uh, the size of the ray may matter instead. There may be cases where all you care about is one of the objects in that array. And so we can actually add these for the discard pattern, right? We don't care what that first element is. We just care that there's two elements and that the second of them is one of these. And in that case, we'll still get the same behavior because the second thing we're passing in is this testing, right? And so all it cares is that the array we're being passed has that as a second value. So I've thrown quite a lot at you so far. I hope you can see some of the benefits in some of these cases where pattern matching can really simplify what you're doing and start to think about instead of having it define code that's going to be executed based on different things, that you're really using pattern matching to define what the value of something is. That is a big idea in what we're talking about with the simple as well as the switch kind of pattern matching. This allows you to write much simpler code that is just going to translate some set of things into another set of things that you need to output. Uh, this sort of idea, you can think about these things as being mildly functional in nature. Well, if you've gotten this far, I'm, I'm surprised. Most of you don't. But if you did, please go ahead and like and subscribe really helps the channel. We're really trying to beef up. And I also wanted to announce a course here I'm going to be doing in Atlanta. It's going to take place in the end of March. You'll see a little blurb about it here and how you can go ahead and be ready to sign up. We're going to be announcing signups pretty soon. See you next time on Coding Shorts.